Hello, welcome to my review of The Road to Mars, a 1999 novel from the one and only legend and former Python, Eric Idle. Idle is probably not as well known for his novels as he is for his other work. His fiction bibliography extends to this effort and 1975's Hello Sailor. The story follows two comedians, Alex and Lewis, who perform shows in the outskirts of the colonised solar system with their robot, Carlton. The two get caught up in a terrorist plot involving a cruise ship, while Carlton tries to work out what makes comedy work and why. There may be a reason why Road to Mars has not had a follow-up, or why Idol writes so infrequently. The Road to Mars is, for the bulk of its length, a really poor novel. I'll go out on a limb and say that without Idol's prior fame, there isn't a chance that this book would have been published. Which in itself is odd given that the first part, and the book is split into three, is called Fame and begins with a frame narrative in which a professor, Bill Reynolds, complains about fame, its cause, effect and those that chase it. Reynolds, living in the 23rd century, is studying the 20th century but writing about Ashby and Muscroft who are from the 22nd century because he has found Carlton's thesis on comedy and intends to publish it. Reynolds is a happy-go-lucky sort, and this comes across in his narrative. Fame is a terminal disease. It screws you up worse than your mum and dad. Somewhere in the late 20th century, the pursuit of fame became a way of life. It replaced life after death as mankind's greatest illusion. Fame, you'll live forever. Fame, your chance to revenge your parents. Fame, take that, you nasty kids who were so cruel to me at school. This syphilis of the soul was caused, of course, by the arrival of television. If the medium was the message, then the message was crap, for the TV screens were filled from morning to night with a constant 24-hour shitstorm. Idol is off to an immediate flyer, a dour, cynical and expletive-laden rant against the very medium that gave him the opportunity to be who he is. I'm sure his life in Los Angeles would have been equally as pleasant were it not for that pesky and tiresome fame. And of course, I'm confusing narrator with author here, but given the bulk of Reynolds' writing and Carlton's are on the subject of comedy, it is difficult not to equate the two, perhaps three. Reynolds introduces the idea of the space-based comedy circuits of the previous century, and particularly of Carlton, the mechanical who cannot understand comedy, learning about it from two of the century's finest exponents of the craft, Lewis and Alex. And if Idol had left Reynolds alone at that point, or not included him at all, the book would have been the better for it. Far, far better, as we will see. Instead, we are also told about his love life with Molly and about his intention to bring Carlton's work to the masses. The novel would be better off without both, but particularly the former. After a riot shortens one of their gigs, Alex and Lewis attempt to get a gig on a cruise ship heading to Mars. Their audition goes okay, but Katie Wallace pulls some strings to get them on board. Katie is the mistress of cruise ship owner and mogul Kepler. As part of their induction, she flirts with um, Alex, but then bugs him. Another comedian, Boo, tries out but is unsuccessful. Boo is the equivalent of being in the room with a drunk who thinks he's funny. He has a line for everything, but not a single one is funny, which makes him a strange sort of comedian. Also on board is Brenda Woolley, an ageing and talentless singer with delusions of grandeur. Unfortunately, Alex is critical of her act when Katie introduces him to Kepler, not knowing at the time that Brenda is Kepler's wife. It just takes a few seconds to lose a job, apparently, and Alex and Lewis are back in the job market. They decide to head for Mars on their own, but they stop off at the colony H9, where Lewis decides to meet his ex-wife and child. But Alex has discovered his bug and stops off to meet Sammy Weiss, a hacker, to see what's what. But he also sees some people he knows, including Katie, and decides to follow her. Katie's up to something, but he loses her, returns to Sammy, and finds her dead. The police are waiting for him, but H9 is one of those colonies under a dome, and the dome cracks, prompting a frantic evacuation. To Idol's credit, and by way of a small mercy, he leaves the tedious musings of Reynolds out of this section, and the equally tiresome boo is kept to the periphery. This is genuinely the only part of the book I describe as adequate, and that is largely because nobody is trying to be funny. Katie, Alex, Carlton, Lewis and Lewis's daughter Tay escape in the ship and the cruise ship that rejected them is in the system collecting refugees. But the explosion of the planet H9 causes a shockwave that knocks out the ship. They're drifting in space and narrowly avoid being crashed into by a tanker. 
on board the tanker are the terrorists responsible for the destruction of H9, and they blew that planet up because they thought that Alex and Lewis were onto them, so they activate another bomb, this one on the comedian's ship. Carlton puts the humans in the escape pod and attempts to disarm the bomb, and here, sadly, Idol interjects Reynolds again, salivating like a voyeur over the sex lives of Alex and Katie, who are flirting in the escape pod. But did they or didn't they, I hear you asking. Yes, yes, I can feel your interest. I can hear you demanding details. There are no instruments in this galaxy sensitive enough to detect how little interest I had. There were no details I wanted beyond, did everybody die? That seemed like a big deal. And what's interesting about that too is that Alex is flirting away with Katie like there isn't care in the world, even though Carlton has set off all the ship's alarms and sent them to the escape pod because there's a bomb on board. Thank God Alex is brave and hardy and not the type to be easily scared. Alex was easily scared. Oh, is he? Because ten pages earlier he was refusing to leave an exploding planet without his robot. And what does that say about you, by the way, that you'll endanger your partner and his six-year-old child in order to stay on an exploding planet while you wait for a robot to catch up? Ten pages before that act of selfish, stupid, bravery, he walked in on his old friend and found they'd been murdered. Between discovering the body and interacting with the police, who have every reason to suspect him of murder, the only indications of him being scared are these two lines. His heart was thumping wildly in his chest now. He breathed deeply and walked into the living room. And though he has this reaction to learning the woman's dog is dead, it is fairly tame in the circumstances of being easily scared and at a very recent and brutal murder scene. When they're fleeing from terrorists in the finale, he clowns around without any acknowledgement that people are dying. Just cut this line and none of that makes any difference. But what you write does matter. But back to the story, and between Carlton attempting to trap the sentient bomb and his plan succeeding are ten pages of Sex and Reynolds, which, if you're wondering, is not exactly interesting or exciting, and it really saps the life out of the story at just the wrong moment. From here on in, the road to Mars reverts to its prior form, with Boo also returning, but things had been improving, and that does help the rest of the book hold the interest, but only barely. Back on the cruise ship, Brenda, recognising the opportunity, turns the plight of the H9 refugees into first a photo opportunity and second a benefit concert, all turned to her own benefit, of course. For a 1999 novel, this tone-deaf celebrity exploiting tragedy for a quick virtue signal and fame boost seems highly prophetic, but in a story about terrorism, with people attempting to take over the cruise ship in order to bomb Mars, it is more like filler. And, of course, the astute among you will have noticed that the terrorists have already blown up one planet to keep their main plot quiet. So this terrifying plot to bomb a planet seems somewhat less terrifying than it might have been just a few pages earlier. But even less so when Carlton is hilariously dressing in drag, and Reynolds is now musing that he will publish Carlton's work as his own in order to overcome the DNAism of academics. There's a subplot here of the terrorists holding Katie's father, who was the founder of their cell, but Katie is absent for much of what you might generously call action, so it, too, is little more than a distraction. Eventually the plot, of course, is foiled, and sadly even Boo survives. But Idol can't leave well enough alone, so he tacks on even more Reynolds, who discovers that a century later Carlton is still alive and tries to kill him so he can pass off his work as his own if the first page wasn't bad enough. The book is only a few more pages old when Idol wheels out this hilarious little gem. All that sci-fi bullshit. Going to light speed, sir. Yeah, right, light speed for 5,000 years gets you about as far as the nearest star. Big deal. Wormholes in space? More like assholes in space. If it wasn't bad enough that it reads like the whining of a famous comedian who hates fame, it also seems like the sci-fi author dislikes science fiction as well. What is the need for this? Well, it's a great indication that this is going to be a fun read. During the next 50, 60 pages, the jarring dual narrative, the outright misery of one of the narrators, and the poor standard of the writing generally made me want to quit on this book. Until H9 blows up and Reynolds is thankfully sidelined for a bit. It's like pulling teeth. But the strange thing is, Idle knows that Reynolds is awful. 
he even says so through Reynolds. Look, I'm sorry to keep interrupting the flow of the narrative like this, but there is an emergency. I promise you this will be the last time. I realise it's not particularly cool that all these interjections by the narrator may be rather irritating, but I'm a scientist, not a novelist. I don't know anything about story or maintaining the through line. If you know you're doing something detrimental to your story, why are you doing it? I think Idol is only really interested in pontificating on comedy that the plot is secondary to that, but the terrorist plot is the only part of the book that isn't like scraping nails down a blackboard. Isn't that strange that the bits that aren't supposed to be funny are the best bits of this comedy book? That's not to say that they're good, but during the hundred page or so detour to H9, I was at least reading contentedly and not wanting to stop completely. But when H9 does explode, the limitations of the author are shown by the repetitive prose he uses, and uses sparsely, preferring to just load up pages of dialogues. H9 gave another groan. Another large metallic groan from the bowels of H9 brought him back to his senses. The whole time H9 groaned and shuddered. H9 was rocking and shaking, the groaning sounds amplified. But even with prose like that, he'd be better off stripping the dialogue right down because most of it is difficult to read and impossible to read without wishing it was shorter, quicker, simpler, or at least over. It's all supposed to show how quick-witted the characters are, especially Alex and Boo, who is instead an exercise in reader cruelty. But none of the dialogue raised a chuckle. In fact, it's hard even to recognise what is supposed to, apart from when Idol tells us that somebody laughed at it. This was the first joke I recognised as an attempt at humour, but then I could hardly fail to recognise it, having first heard this when George Michael and Andrew Ridgely were still a double act, and a funnier one than Lewis and Alex. What's that useless piece of skin at the end of a penis called? A man. Is a member of Monty Python really regurgitating other people's old jokes? At least in this exchange, somebody points out that there was an attempt at comedy. You walk out of my life, you run away without even saying goodbye, and you expect me to come waltzing back just like that. You know me, Sam, I can't waltz. Don't be funny. Oh, he won't. Not a single time in 308 pages. But Boo asked if he believes in an afterlife, quips. I was here in a previous wife. Up in the lighting scaffolding, someone appeared to be having a coughing fit. It's just a shame that the only person laughing is fictional. Near the end of the book, Alex is going through Brenda's makeup room and he begins to mimic a tour guide, putting aside the placement of this when you're trying to escape from terrorists. Is this funny? And this is where Brenda keeps her heads, said Alex. Oh honey, you give great heads. Clearly, there's a gag here, and this is how you tell it. Earlier in the book, when Alex is talking to Lewis about why his marriage fails, he says something like, she gave bad head. Then the ship is exploding, and one of Brenda's makeup heads, or even her real one, flies into Lewis, and he hands it off to Alex, who says, it's you that gives bad head. And if that feels a little contrived, it won't even be in the same league as introducing the ideas of history bars, as in a place where people go to learn about history while drinking and doing other bar stuff, then making it Yeti night, even though nothing in the book is about Yetis at all, in order to shoe in this line, the Yeti, said Carl. That damn thing was harder to find than the clitoris. The Yeti scene is painfully contrived, but at least consistent because Idol turns a lot of scenes to sex, even when it's horribly out of place. The worst example is the ruining of the most dramatic part of the book with ten pages of nonsense. My grandfather was consistently the funniest person I knew, so I would never suggest that you're too old to be funny, though Idol himself does. But my god, you can be too famous to be funny, because I do not want to share in Eric Idol's sexual obsession. At the top of each section, and there are a great many, is a quote, often from a comedian. And let's just have a look at a couple of these because they really show something. This quote is funny. It's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. But Idol here is quoting Woody Allen. In his next example, he's quoting Alex Muscroft, his own creation, and it just doesn't work. As physical comedy on a stage it might, but physical comedy on the page is usually just awkward. There are more than 100 elements, but the most important element is surprise. Boo. If you laughed at that, it was because of how bad it was. In conclusion, there are too many characters and too many of them are unfunny clowns for this book to work. In fact, it only really works at all when nobody's trying to be funny. Otherwise, it's contrived, awkward and old. The sad thing is that Idol knows his own narrator is ruining his book. He leaves him out for a good section when things start to get dramatic. And without this brief section of near competence, I doubt I'd have finished reading this book at all. 
Alex is mildly annoying throughout, even though his behaviour is at odds with Idol's own description of him, while Boo is an utterly painful character, his appearances are the literary equivalent of waterboarding. They drag the plot back, and there are just too many irritating characters for a single book for him to be necessary. The road to Mars exists for Idol to turn his considerable experience of working in comedy into an essay he dresses up in a pretty average story. But the pretty average story would be better off without it. The essay I can do without completely. I think the only joke here is that Idol wrote a book with a single purpose of annoying people, and he sits in his mansion chuckling to himself about sci-fi nerds getting upset about it. <clears throat> While he and the rest of the Monty Python Brigade are comedy institutions, legends of TV and stage. The evidence here is that even with all that glory to fall back on, it doesn't necessarily translate into a good book, or even an average one. Not recommended. Thank you for watching. Liking and subscribing is the way to get more of this sort of thing.